Uh, Pat Windrow with the Cable Easel once again with part two of a study of um, a wonderful marshy uh, area here on the uh, north shore of Long Island uh, between Stony Brook and Setoket called the um, West Meadow Wildlife Preserve. What it is is an excuse to tell you about a, an event, uh, a seasonal event that's taking place right now. The snowy egret and the American egret are there resting until they go south. It's, uh, it's a wonderful sight to see. You don't see these things very often. There are blue heron down here and um, some of the footage that was shot down at the beach uh, has a few of the of the birds who are rather reclusive and they are also sometimes make sure that they are sort of invisible but um, we did get a few shots of some of them and hopefully this uh, study will will probably not be able to compare to Mr. Van Gogh's uh, crows in a cornfield, which I don't know whether anybody is too familiar with, but which I have always found to be one of the more intriguing paintings of all time of nature. Um, I'm going to, I'm working towards the foreground. I'm going to be doing uh, the uh, part of the, um, some of this marshland here has creeks in it. And uh, they are, they are just wonderful little places to go and investigate. They sort of hide and harbor a, a lovely uh, various sections of wildlife, some crustaceans, uh, billions of fiddler crabs live here. Uh, in the summertime, mullet come up. There are, of course, toadfish, and there are blowfish, and cat, sometimes catfish, not very often. But there is, a, there is one of these, this is one of those, these nifty places which are right here and which we possibly uh, should be, pay a great deal of attention to in order to make sure that it does not disappear. Uh, there are some people who don't have the same feelings about these wild places as I do and as many other people do, and they do in fact go there and uh, beer cans and styrofoam cans and newspapers and old rags and tires and you name it, it's there. However, uh, somewhere along the line we're going to try to be able to get through to these people and get them to understand that what is here is absolutely invaluable and cannot be replaced by any technology known to man. Nobody can replace this or cure it once it dies. So here we have the resting place on the, uh, on the egret's trip to the south because of the winter migration. Uh, you can see them, they're out there. Uh, as, I'm, as I'm talking to you, I'm, I'm uh, interpreting the, uh, uh, the bank of the shoreline of this nice little uh, sort of a, this is a sort of an extra creek. This is a little finger that goes off from the main creek, uh, but it's, uh, it's uh, the place where they, uh, where they do find a refuge, and they hide, and they, uh, they, they're not breeding at this point. This, uh, Dr. Ernst told me that that is all over with. What they are now doing is heading south. Uh, uh, he is one of the people highly responsible for um, uh, making uh, people aware, uh, Stephen Engelbright for one of them, aware of the remarkable treasure that we have here in this uh, wildlife preserve. Fortunately, some people had the foresight to, um, to preserve it, to buy it and preserve it. One of the men was called Ward Melville. Uh, there's a high school in, uh, in the Three Village area, the Ward Melville High School. He is the man who, who was able to uh, raise the consciousness a long, long time ago, 50 years. He came out here in the 
1840s, and um, he began to do the thing pre pre of preserving the wildlife and the areas, such as this one. It's now being managed by the Stony Brook Community Fund, and it is a small treasure in its own right. Here is the uh, here is an introduction of a little bit of the green that is reflected in this water from the uh, marsh grasses, and I was uh, working on the uh, on the. Uh, tree. See, isn't that lovely? Isn't that absolutely wonderful looking? I haven't done a very good job on making that look like that. I would if I had some more time, but it's, this is the general feeling of how you would approach this. But that water grows right down by the, I mean, the grass grows right down by the water, and then, is there, and then in there are all these neat things. And when, when we were down there shooting this, the camera person, Mike Fagan, and I were down there shooting this, little fishes jumping all over the place in the water, getting very excited over something. And um, the the activity is wonderful. Then suddenly, from a distance, you will see uh, five or six huge, audacious crows take off and light in the very tops of the very tallest trees in the distance. And then a flight of some kind of small bird, more than likely swifts and things, uh, take off and look like pepper. Now there you see them on your um, on your monitor. I mean, those are those are birds that are flying in groups, and uh, it's almost you can almost hear the whirring of the wind of the wings when they go by. Uh, I think that little group of birds was being chased by a crow. The crows are very uh, protective of their environment and they don't want anybody mucking around in their skies. I think I'm going to, while we have that fresh in our minds, I'm going to see if I could get some kind of an interpretation of what that flock looked like. Uh, it, is, it, it is very small and they are, there are many of them and they're all in sort of a little, a little group together. Uh, they, are, they fly sideways and forwards and so on. So they do look uh, a little bit as though there's a mistake in the canvas, but we'll know what they are. They are the, they are the wonderful uh, flight of birds. Um, there they are. Oh. Oh, it takes your breath away when you see them because you, you can't realize the number and the manner in which they travel in that, in that tight formation. It's, it's almost as if they were being guided by some uh, electronic guiding system. And behind them was the proverbial crow, which I think I'm just going to put in here as a very tiny speck in the sky. He, will, um, uh, he won't mind being uh, almost ignored because, after all, he doesn't even know I'm doing it. So there, this crow, they, they have huge wings and they're extremely fast and uh, very noisy and wonderful. Anyway, uh, birds. The excuse for this painting is birds. Uh, however, I must uh, do work towards the foreground and uh, the, um, the, the little marshy area down here needs to be simply uh, f filled in somewhat with some more of this pale blue color which is behind the tree. Not not pale enough, and that I'll put that in with some quick drying white, so that when I see you see the tree was drawn in, but you must put all the blue behind it in case the lacy quality of the tree wants to see through it. This is planning ahead, uh, something that I find uh, one must do rather often uh, in landscape painting. You plan ahead about what you do in order to get the background prepared for what is going before it. It's, um, it's a habit. I have, uh, I have never gotten out of the habit because I find that if you don't do it, you're in deep trouble. The, um, the interpretation of that tree, of course, has got to be done with care and with observation and with my very special, wonderful brush, which is the, uh, which is the one to do it. However, as the, uh, as the uh, time wears on, and we've still got a little bit of time, I'm going to show you how you uh, have to approach the, uh, uh, the, the doing of this tree. This tree uh, co occupies a rather large area of this painting and it needs to be uh, carefully observed because it has its own particular uh, anatomy. These branches grow out from a main stem and uh, half of the tree is uh, of course hidden outside the picture. But um, the general uh, construction of the tree has to have some attention paid to it. The branches on the bottom of a tree, no matter which kind it is, are always larger than the ones at the top. Something to uh, always remind yourself because you, uh, well, I've seen, ch children don't remember this when they're doing it. And then if you tell them once, they do sort of know it subliminally, but they have to be reminded when they're doing it in, in actual uh, context of doing a painting. So, 
um, uh, down here uh, with my brush full of uh, uh, formula color because I'll put the paler greens in later. The dark greens go in first and then the sunlit uh, branches of these trees get put in afterwards. You can see that the um, pale yellow uh, ochre marsh in the distance is almost obliterated but it has to be there for logic. And I keep talking about logic but every once in a while you have to, uh, you have to see that you can, something is behind it which is logical. And here as you can see I've got the, um, I've got the branches of the trees uh, bisecting, overlapping uh, the, uh, the marsh. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's all a question of technique and it's also, also a question of remembering what you did the last time. So uh, as this tree progresses and begins to cover up most of the creek, not all of it, but most of it, um, it, um, it the technique is merely a repetition of, uh, of, of the whole uh, business of building this tree. It has to be accurate, it also has to be pleasing because this is one of the main components of this painting. If the tree isn't well done, then the painting has failed. All the nice uh, technique in the sky uh, is of no use whatsoever. If this tree that occupies such a lot of space in the composition is not accurate, it is going to be a failure. So um, you spend some time on it. However, I'm going, to, um, I'm going to talk about the flight of these birds and show you how, how to interpret uh, the flight of a bird that's something that moves so rapidly uh, that you find yourself uh, wishing that they'd slow down, of course they did, they'd fall. So you let them uh, fly as quickly as, you, as they can and you simply keep watching them. They tend to have the same f flight pattern uh, no matter how, f how often they go into the air. They flap their wings in the same pattern. Uh, you have to try, kind of be there to try and grab it. I have a little brush uh, ready to, um, to try to interpret uh, the flight of a bird. It's a, it's a tiny brush with some diluted uh, paint, uh, white paint on it, and um, I think that when one of them uh, gets against the dark, uh, the dark background, you will find yourself really very intrigued with the, the beauty of these flight patterns. I think I'm going to place one. You can place one anywhere you want to because they, uh, they sort of tend to move very rapidly, but uh, when they're in the distance, of course, they're very, very small, and they're nothing more than just a speck someplace back there. But if you, if you introduce them that way, then the closer they come to you, then you can, in fact, have them, uh, have them uh, a little bit more in detail. Uh, they have a long neck, and they have long feet, and long yellow feet. I'm not going to put yellow feet on them because they're just not visible. When they're, when they're flying, their feet are tucked up underneath them. But there is a, there's a beauty in the sky. See this? See that wonderful, uh, that wonderful pale uh, white pattern uh, up there, and then there's another one that's got his wing down. Uh, that wing down is very typical. I'm going to put him down here. See his wing is is is, is um, they're both down, uh, so they're in that uh, down sweep of the wing. Uh, Oh, what, a, what, what an amazing uh, thing it is to watch these birds because they're huge enough to be able to, uh, yeah, to see them. Uh, gulls, are sometimes uh, you don't see them as clearly, but these birds are enormous. And um, they, uh, that's sort of a failure. There's a wonderful, there's a wonderful uh, view of one of them with the wing uh, very clearly uh, raised and uh, the other one sort of going off to the side and there. Well, um, they do have shadow on them, so sometimes you don't see all of the white. And it's uh, and there's a this one I don't like. I'm going to take it off. It was the wrong. Uh, it was a um, not a very uh, understandable position of that wing. Uh, the the down the down flap of the wing is not really always understandable. So as, so with oils, of course, you couldn't do this with watercolor. You'd be in you'd be in trouble with watercolor, but it can come right off with the oils. Uh, then, then th th when they're up against the sky, they uh, they uh, turn a little bit darker. They're still white, but there's some darkness to them because of the shadow. And um, uh, I believe I'll just put a little bit of shadow underneath one here, underneath this, so that it's comprehensible. And then over here, I will uh, where there's a lump. I'll take that lump off with my fingernail. There's one with this wonderfully outspread wings and that long, graceful body. Uh, that long body that um, that is. Um, 
typical of the uh, of the uh, American egret, which is a larger bird, and uh, they are really something to behold. There's a lot of white there. Let me see if I can get this brush clean enough. I'll put the white on the lower part of that wing, and then it'll be something of a completed study uh, on the wing, as it were. Uh, if you are out there and you see this and you find yourself um, in very, very uh, in trouble to try to differentiate uh, or to understand what you're seeing, take the video camera. Everybody has a video camera, I understand, except me. My video camera is in my two eyes. But uh, you take the camera out and study these things. Um, it's worth the effort. It's actually really worth the effort. This is a little bit darker on this, on this uh, side of his wing and uh, the body is a little bit darker. And boy, is this, is this wonderful to watch when it happens. And this other wing comes out here. Good. Well, the egrets. The egrets are flying. The crows are flying. Uh, the swifts are out there. The gulls are out there. There are some gulls. Uh, and uh, as far as gulls are concerned, we'll come back and talk about them. I'm going to take a short break now, and I'll be back very shortly. the completion of this sort of a lovely episode um, <coughs> of the uh, the resting place of the snowy egret on his way down to the uh, low, to the warmer climes for the winter time. Uh, it's taking place right now. You can drive out there and see if you can catch a glimpse of them. Uh, it's almost like that meteor thing. You take a chance, try and find see the meteor. But if you're patient enough, I guess maybe you can in fact catch some of these events. Uh, I'm still working on this tree in the background here, but I think I will abandon that for the moment and show you how to handle the grasses in the foreground because uh, I have. I've discovered that if I don't get, cover most areas uh, quickly, uh, the time runs by and then I think things are left totally um, unfinished. So with the, um, with the thought that the, uh, the uh, background uh, for the grasses has been taken and it's, and it's there waiting, it is a question of reducing the paint to an extremely thin consistency with turpentine Turpentine and some um, and some of my archival oils, which uh, has taken the place of the lead-based marage medium that I used to use, and I, which I've decided that I don't need to uh, to really take the chances of working anymore. I've been working with that medium now for a very very long time, and it's time to stop because there is lead lithard lead in it, and in any man's book or woman's book or scientist's book, that is lethal stuff. Well, as you see, I've got this reduced to an ink-like consistency, and I'm going to just, just diligently start the uh, the uh, tops of this grass. It's got to be done. It is a uh, it is part of the business of being a realist painter, whereby all of the things that intrigue you about this painting are because of the subtleties of the component parts. The tops of this grass are almost white against the blue of the of the uh, little creek water. 
therefore uh, they they must be done that way and uh, uh, then they become green down below but uh, the tops of them are white I think that the monitor will tell you that that observation is absolutely correct and um, so it is merely a question of setting your mind to the fact that you're gonna have to sit here and do this uh, to get the tops of this grass uh, clearly set against the pale blue background uh, that's the planning ahead that I talked about a moment ago. Uh, as far as the uh, as far as the um, wildlife is concerned out here, the um, uh, there are uh, tremendous quantities of people that are really very concerned about it, and uh, they are concerned about it and do something about it. Nora Bredes is one of them. She's the county legislator and doing a wonderful job. She's uh, she got really furious uh, a couple of weeks ago when the uh, bulldozers were there um, uh, taking trees down in uh, Laurel Hill Kettle. Park. Park. Uh, that was an episode that maybe you have read about, maybe you haven't. But there was a, a watershed preserve over there in Laurel Hill, which is just off Nichols Road by the hospital. And um, by golly, some uh, some developers got the uh, okay to go in and bulldoze those trees, taking down literally hundreds of trees in this uh, in this water uh, area, which which affects our water table. Now, uh, how anybody can sort of ignore the fact that the water table is vital to our existence is beyond me. But um, so Nora Bredes uh, is uh, is doing a, a wonderful job. So is, of course, our dear friend um, uh, Stephen uh, Engelbright, and. Um, a lot of other people are really very much involved. I was when I lived here, and I still would be had I, if I lived here, but I'm doing my very small share by doing this kind of a lecture as well as a painting demonstration. Here is where the green grasses are beginning to turn green down below their fuzzy tops. Uh, I think that you'll agree that uh, the monitor tells you that that's the way they're working. That's the way these grasses are behaving at this time of year. They're beginning to fade and die and dry up and, uh, you know, going to rest for the winter and then they'll be back. Come the, uh, come the spring, these things will be back brilliant green, but right now they're in the flux. They're in a state of transition. They're becoming, they're becoming less green, turning a little bit yellow, and of course, uh, very eventually, within a matter of weeks or maybe just a month or two, they'll be lying flat. Uh, without uh, much life in them at all. Uh, however, that's the resting period that we, uh, we know they have to take. The, um, the other thing about this creek is that the winter, oddly enough, even though it gets battered uh, by winds and, uh, and terrific snowfalls and so on, is actually a, 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 a period in which this poor creek and its uh, water and its banks can recover from the onslaught of summer play, which takes place here with motorboats racing up and down this creek, not at five miles an hour as the signs request them to do, but at 40 miles an hour, high-powered boats in this creek raising great waves and literally chewing up uh, the, uh, the banks uh, which are vital for the uh, preservation of this wildlife. So once again, um, without meaning to sound as though I'm lecturing people at every turn, uh, it's just that I talk about these areas and I tell you what their life uh, expectancy is and possibly what their, how the dangers are that uh, they, uh, their life expectancy could be shortened by behavior. And just like the behavior of the average citizen could help the, uh, the health care uh, bill to succeed by changing some pretty lousy habits that a lot of people have. Alcohol causes tremendous amounts of fatal accidents on the road, and uh, that means that the hospitals get filled with those things, and then, of course, also the uh, smoking with the emphysema. People are in the hospital almost continuously with uh, emphysema because they smoke all the time. So if that health care plan is going to do anything at all, I think that maybe some revisions of behavior uh, might be in very good order. Um, Gee, I certainly do take it upon myself to tell people a lot of stuff. I probably ought to stick to the painting uh, advice and let the, uh, let the others take over the other ones, but I just can't help thinking about the creek and the way the banks are being worn down by the really genuinely thoughtless behavior of people who own high-powered boats. I find myself really uh, distressed by that. In the foreground here, 
there is some kind of wonderful bluish grass with sort of funky colored weeds coming out of it. And um, just for the color of it, I'm going to sort of interpret it with my palette knife because it's an entirely different type of growth. That Spartina grass is growing by the water, and this is a kind of a green foliage uh, indigenous plant that's uh, has taken root over here, uh, closer onto the land. Um, it's a different color scheme. It's a different texture. And uh, because we're running out of time, I'm just going to sort of let it go at this and show you how the texture could be interpreted with a sort of a stubby brush and a little bit of the color uh, that may be in there. Some, some of it is maybe um, uh, uh, Sienna. Uh, some of the leaves are of, of a different tone, but it's all—it's all a question of wonderful texture uh, that we're trying to fool with here in this foreground. Um, when you're out there, you'll be able to understand why I'm concerned about texture, why I'm really uh, finding myself uh, thinking of many of these places like quilts uh, with uh, very intricate needlework and wonderful different pieces of fabric that are all making up for a very multi-varied uh, pattern. Uh, so uh, I don't necessarily think that one should look at the, uh, the landscape as a, um, as a quilt, but it certainly gives, you, gives the imagination flights of fancy. Uh, I have done a quilt which was accepted in, uh, in the um, uh, National Pacific Quilt Show. I sent it off to San Francisco uh, the day before yesterday, and it's a competition. I'll let you know what happened. But I will, my, one of my big quilts of New York City, uh, and you didn't know I sewed, did you, um, is going to be on exhibit at the uh, Regency Hyatt uh, in uh, San Francisco. Hooray and rah, rah, rah. Um, but it's, it's all got to do with the business of uh, patterns. Uh, the quilt is made almost entirely of pieces of fabric of different patterns and ribbons. And the skyscrapers in the quilt are made of the ribbons and things with uh, squares that look like windows. And so the whole pattern, the whole thing was a very amusing and interesting uh, project of mine, which, um, uh, which got me accepted into the, uh, the International Pacific Quilt Show. <laughs> anyway, I've got very short time to go. The, uh, the painting of the great big wonderful delicious looking tree here is still got to take place. And um, uh, wh while I put some of this very dark stuff in here, I'll take another brush and show you how the sunlit parts of this tree will catch, uh, catch some extremely pale uh, tones of green and that, with that will give the tree a little bit of a third dimensional quality to it instead of just a silhouette. Uh, some of these, uh, some of these um, branches near me are, uh, are sunstruck and therefore they are very pale and they give the tree a sort of a nice, a nice second uh, dimensional quality. Well, the, uh, the dreaded time has come. My, uh, my allotted moment with you for this painting is over. Uh, it was part two of a, uh, of a nice observation of the uh, snowy egret uh, resting in our harbor here uh, down at West Meadow Beach. I hope you liked it. I hope you were interested as I am in it. If you weren't, well, maybe the next show will do better with you. Thanks for watching. See you whenever I get back here uh, live on the last Tuesday of every month. And otherwise, I'm on tape. Look for me on the program guide on channel 14 in case you have trouble knowing where I'm at. Bye-bye.